Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Joe Drinkwalter, local actor and musician, and your host for the Arts People podcast. Welcome to the third part of what will be a five-part series, the goal of which is to highlight interesting and important people and organizations within the arts community here in North Bay. Big thanks to Back in the Bay, Small Town Times, Dave Dale, and the wonderful people at Clark Communications for uh, providing this wonderful space and making the show possible. Our guest today has been involved in North Bay's theater community, Forever, an actor since he walked the halls of Scholard Hall Secondary School, but most know him uh, for his time as a teacher of 28 years before transitioning to the life of an agent for film and television where he works currently. He is responsible for a great deal of local actors and theater makers finding their passion and honing their talent while they were in the prestigious Arts Nipissing program. He now represents roughly 100 actors as the agent and owner of the rapidly growing Nexus Talent Agency based here in North Bay where he finds work for actors in a rapidly growing growing northern film industry and beyond. Welcome to the show, arts educator and acting agent extraordinaire, <laughs> Rob McCoven. Thank you for we don't having have any, me, Joe. We don't have any applause for you, but I can okay. edit it in later. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks for uh, coming on the show. Let's just jump right in. Let's do it. Cool. Personally, we'll start right at the beginning. Do you remember a time in your life before the arts? Not really. No. no. Uh no, I think about like uh, Christmas concerts in uh, elementary school, uh, my mom making, you know, costumes and, uh, and me getting to say like my first lines on stage. And yeah, I don't really, I don't, uh, I mean, my, uh, my mom and my sisters were all uh, girl guide and brownie leaders. So the idea of craft and performance was just a part of our house all the time, right? So. Nice. Yeah. Do, you, do you have like an early arts memory, theater memory that, uh, that oh, you remember? Well, yeah, I mean, I remember <laughs> I remember uh, the very first line I ever said was uh, I was playing like a, a shepherd or whatever it was. And I said something to the effect of uh, I, I couldn't give him anything. So I gave the baby Jesus my heart. <laughs> and it's, I remember that. Nice. <laughs> I know I remember my family going, good for you. Oh, you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then I lucked out uh, in grade seven. Um, I met uh, my teacher, Edna Boyer, who was also uh, bas basically North Bay royalty in part with the Gateway Through to Guild. And she gave me a role in a school production of uh, Ebenezer Scrooge. But unlike your typical elementary teacher directing a play, I mean, this woman was directing a play. Yeah. She was making sure I knew... Every place to move, every nuance of the character. It was the, my foray into the very idea that, you know, this is what it means to be an actor. And not was, just was that kind guy. of the moment where you were like, yeah, this is this is what I want to do? Yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah. And then, of course, <laughs> like probably like you or like so many other people, I went home and I'm like, yeah, this is what I want to do. Yeah. And my mom and dad are like, well, have you thought about something else to Anything fall back else. on? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. There's a beautiful line in uh, Mr. Holland's opus the, with uh, Richard Dreyfus, when he says, "I took a teaching job uh, because I, you know, I wanted to be a musician, but I always wanted to have something to fall back on. But I never thought I'd be falling back on it, right? <laughs> so, so for me, it was the same way. I mean, I ended up becoming a teacher, but my love all along was I wanted to be on the stage. I wanted to be in the film. That's, I mean, I was making up uh, cassette tape." Um, sequels to Jaws when I was a kid. And, uh, How'd you do the shark? Uh, I didn't. It was all on cassette tape, right? So nobody can see the shark. It's oh, just, like a kind of like a, literally an audio, an audio recording. Nice. Yeah, and I'm so I'm in my basement, and of course every single episode uh, had to end with uh, me as Brody saying. Smile, you son of a bitch. It didn't matter what else happened in the story. <laughs> I had to shoot the shark at the end and say, smile, you son of a bitch. And there was always an next shark. There's always oh, there's another. always. Yeah, or well, I mean, or... even in the movie, there was always <laughs> another shark. So, yeah, no, there's always another shark for sure. So by high school, you were fully invested in theater. It, yeah. That was kind of what you wanted to do. Yeah, and, then, and the weird thing was Scholar didn't have, uh, I mean, now it does, right? Yes. And you know that. Um, Scholar had a, a drama program. When I was there, it didn't. Uh, and we had after school plays, but it was run through the girls college, St. Joseph's college. Oh. And then there was a discussion about people going over to take 
uh, English courses at Scholard. And I went to my mother who worked at, uh, at St. Joseph's College and I said, uh, hey, if the bus is going over to Scholard with the girls to do English and whatever else, can the bus not run over to St. Joseph's College so we can take drama with uh, Don McNeil? And so I took uh, your buddy, Al McCaskill, with me. I took uh, Mike McCloskey, Brent Summers, a whole bunch of us. And there were like eight or nine of us. Craig Mason was another one. He was a friend of mine. And we just said, we got eight guys. Let's do it. How, how was arts education maybe different back then as it is today in high school? Well, drama was different because in my day, when we were taking dramatic arts, most of it was based on uh putting together scenes and plays and things like that. Whereas the modern day drama teacher is, you know, using drama to, to teach confidence and stuff. I'm not saying that we didn't get those same elements, but it wasn't like drama was this uh, domain for people to kind of, you know, find themselves. Drama was like what we did in there was we learned to act. That's what we did. And I obviously, as an arts nipissing teacher, uh, when I was at Whittafield and and even at West Ferris in the end, that's always been my thing is that, you know, like drama's great, but I want to be a theater teacher. I'd always put, you know, Whittafield theater, not Whittafield drama, because I, I see them as two different things. As a teacher, I like to pick your brain a little bit. What uh, is one of your favorite kind of acting techniques to as an actor to use or teach? You already know the answer to this question. But I yes, never had yeah, you as a yeah, I, I don't know, know the answer okay, to this, actually. The answer to this question is that uh, the ultimate theater guru for me is a, a gentleman by the name of Sanford Meisner. Okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> and, yeah, and the Meisner technique is my, uh, it's my go-to. Now, it's not the only thing I teach because I – you know, I do teach Uta Hagen and I teach Stanislavski, so people know about that. But then I also teach uh, Ivana Chubbuck. For, for those that might not be familiar, could you give a little, like, elevator pitch, crash course? <laughs> like, Meister you don't have technique. to go. We could be here for hours, yeah, I'm okay, sure. So <laughs> the simplest way to put it is to understand it in, uh, in contrast to, to the other form. So Stanislavski, which I'm sure you learned, uh, Stanislavski uh, would say that in order to play a character— you have to uh, either have experienced it or you got to delve into your mind. You know, you're playing a part about your dead grandmother. So you got to, you know, think about your, your, the time your dog died and you got to really embrace how much your dog died and you got to live in those moments of your past and then take those moments from your past and transfer them into the character you're playing on stage. Meisner because he sees it as unhealthy to kill your dog every night, your actual dog that you've been really loved and really did die in your life or your grandmother or whatever. Meisner says uh, it's based on the imagination. So he says, instead of basing it on the past and what has happened to you in the past, create your imaginative experience from the present. So instead of me actually using my dead grandmother, I decide that uh, you and I are best friends and I imagine uh, that uh, I've just heard, before I come on stage, I've just heard that uh, you're dead. You know, you died in, in a horrible car accident or whatever it is. Uh, but the beauty of that is that I can let that work through me as an actor, but I can also text you as soon as it's over and go, hey man, you good? And you're like, yeah, I'm good. Yeah. So it's healthier. Yeah, for you're sure. Na- you're not. You're not literally. I mean, that's the whole uh, Daniel Day Lewis. I mean, he's a brilliant actor. Oh yes. But the guy, by his own admission, he says, you know, he's he's played a lot of people and been a lot of people, and he's immersed himself in it in the Stanislavski way. Yeah. That he's a little bit messed up. Yeah. But, well, and so you mentioned you know, again, just literally the term healthy and unhealthy techniques. Speaking yeah. of unhealthy techniques. Uh, method acting is kind of a conversation in, it's a controversial topic, I guess, right now, yeah, but mostly see, in Hollywood. So it sort but, of depends on whether you're talking about method acting. Stanislavski, when he taught method acting, it wasn't the same as what the uh, Americans do for method acting. Could you define kind of the, the, the current uh, definition? Well, the current like the- definition would be very similar, like I said, to the, you're going to immerse yourself in it. So what you're going to do is, uh, I mean, I'm using some really simple examples, but... 
Uh, you want every person on set to call you by the name of the character. So when Daniel Day-Lewis is playing Abraham Lincoln, people aren't coming up to him saying, uh, Daniel, can I get you coffee? Yeah. They're saying, hey, Abe, can I get you coffee? He's wandering around town in wherever they did it, in somewhere in Virginia. Uh, he's wandering around town and he's going out for breakfast as you Abraham know, Lincoln. the guy, right? Yeah. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. Some of the best actors in the world, Pacino is a method actor, yeah. you know, and he's he's brilliant. And De Niro is a method actor and he's brilliant. But every one of them uh, also had the opportunity to continue to train and train with other people. Some of them trained with uh, Stella Adler, who kind of used method, but kind of did something else. And then some of them had the opportunity to train with Lee Strasberg, who kind of used Stanislavski's method, but then developed his own. And so it's, method acting is, is like this big term for, I immersed myself in the character so much that I lost myself along the way. Hmm. And when I use the Meisner thing, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. Do you recommend maybe like kind of different techniques depending on the role you're taking on? Yeah, totally. I mean, like, you're gonna I'm be, be playing... if you're going to be in a stage musical, the chances yeah. are you're not necessarily going to use Meisner. <laughs> and it was always really made me, me laugh because uh, when people would be doing a play and uh, especially after I taught them, I remember like there were some students at West Ferris, I taught them Meisner and then uh, Mr. McCaskill was, uh, was trying to do something with them, like <laughs> Pippin or whatever it was. And they would say... Uh, you know, but I just, I just can't really get in touch with, you know, how my characters, <laughs> and he's looking at them like, dude, just say the line, like just <laughs> sing the song, you know, like it's not, it's not like math where, you know, as you're looking at, you know, as X approaches infinity, yes. that never changes. Right. But acting, it's, you take pieces of this, pieces of that, yeah. and it becomes, that's in, art. That's in, the essence of art, right? When I was in, in theater school, we used the term the actor's toolbox. Right. So you build a toolbox of, okay, I can use Meisner. I can use Yeah, what know, do I need else. for this role exactly. at this time? Like when you're, uh, when you're working on Sons of Anarchy with Kurt Sutter, who's a uh, Meisner graduate, of course, I'm going to watch that show. I can tell you that those guys are using the Meisner technique. Yeah. And you can see it at work, yeah. right? Um, so, but if I'm doing arrested development, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not probably not using the Meisner technique. And yeah. after high school, you pursued uh, post-secondary education for Yeah, for acting, but I, for um, I did, uh, I did an English literature uh, degree uh, through the University of Waterloo. But I also did uh, dramatic arts as a, as a minor at the time, and uh, and I was involved in in University of Waterloo productions and stuff like that as well too. Is there any examples of stuff maybe that they did back then that just wouldn't fly nowadays? Or? Oh, tons of things that they wouldn't do now. Yeah, I mean, like we did back in uh, when I was at University of Waterloo, we did a production of um, the uh, Taming of the Shrew, which of course is a play that most people wouldn't even touch at all now. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, there, there's kind of maybe a movement now, uh, and I don't know if it's a movement, but just an idea that that maybe now there are some plays or, or scripts that shouldn't be touched. What, what are your, your thoughts on that? Uh, I do not agree. Is there, <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. it, the, I think what it comes down to is uh, I don't think it's that uh, there are scripts that shouldn't be touched. I think it is that there are scripts that people uh, will shy away from. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a good thing. Uh, my favorite play in the whole entire world is a play called Equus about a boy who stabs out the eyes of six horses. And as the play reveals itself, you discover that it's because of the religion that he was raised under, his understanding of sex and all the, it's, a, it's an amazing play. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe was on Broadway in, cool. the, in the play. And there's a, an amazing movie with uh, Richard Burton. Do I think that play should still be taught? Yeah. Do I think that place should still be done? Absolutely. Is anybody going to do it? No way. Is anybody going to do it in North Bay? Not on your life. Yeah. You know, the world has, has moved on. And, and, and perhaps that's not a bad thing because there are certainly newer scripts yeah. that, that tell a story that's maybe more prevalent to, to yeah, right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. But to uh, quote Ricky Gervais. Do it. When he says, I tell my wife all of the jokes that I'm going to tell. 
And she says, you probably shouldn't tell that one. And he says, that's the one that's going to the top of the list. <laughs> and that's kind of how I think we need to do, we still need to challenge people. And if all, if everything is going to be completely uh, saccharine coded, I think we're in trouble where yeah. there won't be plays that challenge people. I'm thinking about, I know you had uh, Hannah on your, uh, on your podcast and, uh, and Hannah was a really great defender of the show that we did together when I was at Woodfield on uh, domestic violence. Mm. I just don't think that people are touching those kind of topics in, in high school theater. I think everybody's just kind of playing it safe, hmm. you know? Interesting. So. And so to, to, to put a blanket statement over it, uh, things have changed. Yes, Acting that is training. why I'm an agent and no longer a teacher. And <laughs> that's not a joke. Yeah. That's oh, I, absolutely I, true. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I'm an agent now and not a teacher. Yeah, it was time to go. The uh, the sand shifted yeah. underneath myself and and some of my friends, and that's why we retired. We retired. Interesting. Yeah. So before you were uh, a retired teacher, you were a teacher with the New York North District School Board. Yeah. And before that, uh, you were were an actor and and a theater maker. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your your career in the arts? Well, I got involved in. Uh, Summer Challenge, which was the only theater program at the time. And uh, and the thing about Summer Challenge uh, back in uh, my day, in uh, like the 80s, is that, you know how it's now called uh, Tauros, like theater yep. outreach on stage? Yep. Well, Marty Southcott in art, when they first put together the idea, the idea was that it was a bunch of kids getting together not only to perform, but also to reach out to the community. So we did... Uh, the float for the July 1st parade. Uh, we had like grandparent tees in church basements. Uh, mm -hmm. We did uh, variety show type stuff. So it wasn't just about this big play we put on at the end of the year. It was about a bunch of kids, first of all, as my mother would say, staying off the street and doing something more productive, but also giving back to the community, not just as a performance. I remember uh, Shane Southcott once said to me that the difference between the the world that we occupied when we were part of Summer Challenge and then later on the Tauros world that he directed in is he said that um, we used to leave to go to the beach. We used to leave to go play baseball. Now people leave to go to vocal lessons, music lessons, and dance lessons. It's it's a very different uh, way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I did uh, West Side Story, I did Barnum, I did Fiddler on the Roof, I did, I mean, I could just go on and on and on. And then I got older and uh, and I realized I could get involved in the Gateway Theatre Guild. So then I did that and I got involved in doing shows like Amadeus. Uh, and then I met Rod Carley and then I got involved with him and I did uh, King Lear and I did uh, Henry V, which was a big deal for me because I got to play uh, not only did I get to play Henry V, but I got to to do Shakespeare on stage and I got to be the lead and I got to, you know, basically live and breathe Shakespeare for night upon night. And I also got to hoist the uh, the Stanley Cup uh, above my head at the end. And there were Toronto Maple Leafs fans who came to see the show more than <laughs> once just to see me lift the <laughs> cup above my head because they figured they might so, never see it. So they came to see the show just to see it happen. This show has been a legend to me because I've seen pictures. I've heard about it yeah. for context yeah. because people heard Henry V and then the Stanley Cup and the Toronto Maple Leafs. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about this this adaptation that so you did? So Rod... Uh, Rod Carley is a uh, brilliant uh, man in terms of uh, his ability to, we're talking again about context. Uh, he places uh, a lot of the Shakespeare shows that he's done in uh, a Canadian um, milieu. Well, he, he literally, didn't he win an award for adapting Shakespeare that's into right. a modern context? Exactly. That was yeah, his, and his, also yeah. as the TVO lecturer yes. and stuff like that. Yeah, and so that was, uh, that's Rod's tremendous skill. And what we did there was we told the story of the English and French from the time of Henry V, uh, but we contextualize it for the 1967 Stanley Cup uh, series. And because Rod has an incredible knowledge of uh, Canadian politics, we ran in uh, the idea of separatism that was very prevalent during the 1960s. Uh, we ran in uh, the espionage element of the FLQ, in our play, at the end, 
Uh, and it was dicey because we knew that people were going to be like, wait a second, you know, that's not the play. But in our play, um, Rodney Roy, who was playing like the FLQ member, uh, he shoots me in the back of the head. Yeah. It seems like, though, in the grand scheme of things, a pretty happy ending. The Leafs winning the Stanley Cup, just like they're yeah, going to win that's right, that's what next year, because next year is our year. <laughs> Am I right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I've always been a Habs fan, man. So, <laughs> so wearing the Toronto Maple Leafs outfit was actually kind of hilarious, because I was a Habs fan. So, all through the teaching career, you were still doing acting, um, yeah, you know, in theater absolutely. and film. Like even uh, just before COVID, I finished doing a really awesome play called Other Desert Cities, which was just an absolute blast. I've, I've seen that play. I've read yeah, that play. It's it was a really, play. really great play. And then I, uh, I've done Fringe Festival shows with, uh, you know, Josh and Morgan and Matt. Um, Josh and Morgan and Matt and I are, uh, for Fringe, are going to do an improvisation based on Dungeons and Dragons. I saw that. So, uh, you know, yeah, we're always acting That's somewhere. Be great. Yeah. You you've, were doing acting uh, from high school all the way up until you became an agent. And then at a certain point, of course you still do, but at a yeah. certain point you decided to add teaching onto that. What, what gravitated you to a career in teaching? Well, I worked at uh, Pizza Hut in North Bay and then I worked at Pizza Hut in Ottawa and then I worked at a store in Ottawa and then I realized as my brother-in-law once said, hey, if you're going to be uh, working 40 hours a week, you might as well make $40,000 rather than 4000 So I said... All right. <laughs> so I uh, contacted Scholard and it was actually quite hilarious because I said, oh, I'd really like to come and supply teach uh, if there's a chance um, in the fall. And uh, Jim Mallory, who was the vice principal at the time, said, how about tomorrow? And I lucked out because I was asked to uh, work at Scholard and help with the, uh, the play. And then um, I... I took over at Woodfield and and I started doing things very differently. Yeah. Yeah. So you bounced around a little bit and yeah. but I think most know you as as kind of the drama teacher or or theater teacher at at Woodfield. Yeah. Uh tell us a little bit about Arts Nipissing and the company. So Arts Nipissing was created uh basically to create for the students uh an opportunity to do a high concentration in an art form. Um, so when you graduated from Whittefield, you had an amazing amount of theory and practice to go into an arts program. Like a lot of the kids in the, in the company, which was uh, created by uh, Marty Southcott and, and Art Southcott, a lot of kids in the company uh, were art snippeting students because they were the go-getters. They were the, the students who wanted to um, to pursue acting or lighting. Um, you know, I've had students who graduated who are stage managers, professional stage mm -hmm. managers. I've had, uh, students who graduated who are lighting designers. I've, uh, you know, there are all sorts of, uh, avenues when you're part of the company to then do the Sears festival, which later became, came the NTS festival and all of those opportunities, uh, you know, provided, uh, more opportunities. And then some of those people ended up giving back. Uh, some of them ended up working at Woodfield. Uh, so it's, yeah, it, it was just kind of um, the best of the best, mm -hmm. you know, not all of them went on to pursue acting. Almost, almost all of the ones who were in arts nipissing have done something arts related, mm -hmm. whether they've gone into uh, graphic design, uh, set design, makeup, uh, some of them are working in the film industry now as uh, like script coordinators. Yeah. Um, some of them are lighting technicians. Some of them are uh, sound people. I mean, they're they're everywhere. As as an actor and and as an agent, um, what does a modern film and TV kind of career look like nowadays compared to how maybe it did look twenty years ago? Well, uh, I see breakdowns that say uh, for commercials or whatever, and it'll say things like uh, must have uh, 25,000, uh, you know, you have to be an influencer and you have huh. to have 25,000 hits or whatever, likes or whatever. Yeah. This is how little I care. Um, that's, I don't even know. One of the problems 
that I see in the industry nowadays is uh, you used to hire uh, an actor. Uh, now what you do is you you don't really want to waste your time with all the other stuff, so you hire the person who kind of looks it. Huh. You know, so you, like, I would put down in a breakdown, or not in a breakdown, but I would say in a submission, so-and-so is willing to color their hair, so-and-so is willing to cut their hair, so any of those things, right? Uh, but, well, let's use you as an example. You have two headshots. One is you with a beard, you without a beard. Uh, if you only had one headshot and I put you up, if they can't imagine you with a beard, you're not getting that part. And that bothers me because they should be hiring you because of your ability to act yeah. and storytell, not because of who, what you look like. And sometimes there are rules, uh, like really strict rules. Like uh, when you're auditioning for Reacher, for example, yeah. you have to be six feet or under. Yeah. So as much as Josh Bainbridge would be amazing on that show and has the, he's the, too tall. the combat ability, he's too tall. Because everyone know? has to look tiny compared to, yeah. to uh, uh, what's his name? S the, well, the lead. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and that is how that goes. And I'm sure that, you know, that's probably Alan similar Rich, so. with... Um, with somebody like uh, like Tom Cruise, we know he's short, yeah. right? And so, when you're on set with Tom Cruise, do you have to be under a certain height? I don't know. I I, I don't know how it works. I just know that there those kind of specifics really kind of kibosh the idea of being able to just be the actor, right? Um, it's a difficult gig. Yeah. Uh, I always use the example, I mean, obviously I got a lot of youth actors, right? And, and their parents are, uh, you know, they want their kids to be stars. And that's one of the bigger problems actually is that everybody wants to be a star because TikTok influencers prove the point that all you need to do is just, you know, do one thing and now, now you're a star. Yeah. And the problem there, that sort of star experience is uh, it takes away from the idea that there's a craft, there's a process, it's time. Uh, and the example I always use with the the parents who say to me, you know, well, you know, she's had three auditions. You know, she's very discouraged. I say, Mark Ruffalo had 600 and he didn't get a part. Yeah. Now he's the Hulk. That's great. But at the time, he had 600 auditions and he didn't get a part. Yeah. So I don't know what the secret is. People ask me and I go, if I knew that, I'd be rich. Yeah. If I knew exactly what people should do in a self-tape, I'd be rich. I do know that people should have a backdrop that is not messy. Yeah. I do know that people shouldn't have distracting things in the foreground. I do know that people should look the way they do in their headshot. Uh, good sound, good lighting, all that kind of stuff. But aside from that, I have no idea what, yeah. what this, you know, how- There are some guidelines, but I mean, every yeah. casting director probably looks for something a little different. Too. I like think, yeah. And I think when it comes to things like the, the slate, for example, can be, that can win you a mm -hmm. role just simply because- you come across as somebody people want to work with. Again, is it fair to say you know? that that some self tapes a casting director will see, you know, a second of? They'll just see the look and say, "Yeah, no, they're not good for this." Yeah, I think it's yeah. totally fair. Yeah, I, huh. and and I think a lot of people don't understand how many self tapes people see. It takes, yeah, you well, know, oh, like that it's too. it's crazy. Yeah. Like casting directors watching probably for one role might be watching, you know, three hundred to five hundred tapes. Yeah. So when you don't get the part, like it may not be you. It just might just be that on this particular day, you had the wrong shirt on. That like, epiphany is what made, took the weight off of my shoulders. Is just, I'm going to put my best foot forward yeah, every time. And if I don't get it, that's it's, it's just, not you. Yeah. It isn't you, right? And uh, I mean, Cranston has that beautiful comment that he made about uh, they already know you can, you're an actor yeah. because that's on your resume. So show them you. Yeah. Right. And don't, don't try and be much more than you. Uh, but the other uh, great piece of advice I received was from uh, Paul Tessier, who used to uh, direct in in North Bay, and uh, he directed me in Amadeus. And I auditioned another local for him. legend, like another. oh, brilliant, yeah. brilliant man. Yeah. And uh, I came up to him uh, after my audition, and I said, uh, you know, I, I don't feel very good about it. I'm, I'm worried, you know, like I really wanted to part in this. And now I, and he said, relax, man, you're blue. And I said, what? 
And he said, you're blue. I'm doing a blue play. You're blue. You're in the play. If I was doing a red play, you're blue. You're not in the play. Yeah. And I go, that's it. <laughs> like That's the, the most impressive piece of advice I could ever give to any actor. Today, you weren't the same color as the film. That's it. Done. Yeah. Are there any patterns that you see in actors that you know are actors on the roster that, that make people more castable? People that, that maybe book roles a little bit more... Um, uh, actively seeking out the footage that you have uh, the, of the shows that you've done, uh, episodics and features, and then putting those together into real. Like, you did that. You you created a, uh, a reel of some of the stuff you've done as well, and you did independent. And what matters is that it's slick. You've got to make sure you have an up-to-date headshot. Yeah. Yeah, you, you need to look as as present as you currently are. That's that's really key. Fair enough. Yeah, that's because good, otherwise yeah. the person walking in the room is not the same person. Yeah. And you got to win the room. Yes. You you know that from doing uh, Zoom auditions. For sure. But even then, like, yeah. I've, you know, the amount of, of, of Zoom auditions, in-person auditions, like professionally that I've done in total, yeah. very few and far in between. Right. Most of the roles I've gotten, and I'm sure you can, you they can got, they're just self They got like that... Uh, Pre-COVID, but definitely during COVID, yes. they realized, casting directors realized they could see people from all across Canada. Yes. And they didn't have to ever bring them anywhere near Toronto. And that's something, too, right? that that technology has kind of enabled, right? With Actors Access, Casting yeah. Workbook, you mentioned, you know, people can can get auditions from uh, Yeah, and, and Josh can do and Josh can do Star Trek. Yes. Because they don't look at him and go, oh, uh, you know, well, this guy's from North Bay. They go, oh, this guy's good. That's yeah. it. You know, and... We're still trying to crack that nut, like big time trying to crack that nut. But uh, I am not, I am not going to just do here because it's easy. I'm, I'm going to continue to, to fight to get us on those big shows. Of course, you know, like Morgan on Letterkenny yeah. is going to be fantastic. Oh I, yeah, you know, I can't wait. Yeah, Absolutely, it's going to be great. And the other movie that he's got coming out, Aura, Aura, which yeah. you're on as well, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, I've seen I heard some he of the stuff. Fantastic it's, it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's it, right? And it's gonna it's gonna change the game. Yeah. Like, but that's the footage we gotta get. Yes. So very excited for that. Yeah. Big things are coming. Uh, but you you mentioned, uh, of course, the local industry here. Uh, what do you accredit to kind of the, the the film and TV boom in Northern Ontario, specifically North Bay, over the last few years? Well, one of the reasons is because there's a there's a Northern tax credit, right? Yes. So uh, so you bring these productions up here and you, uh, I can't say it's a kickback cause I don't, it doesn't make sense, but, but there's the idea that there is uh, funding that is available, you know, to hire Northern actors or local crew and things like that. Um, so I think that that's part of the boom. The other part of the boom is the, uh, it's just not as um, hard to find places to accommodate people. Uh, you know, the, when you're doing the Toronto scene, uh, you close off one street, that's the same street somebody else wanted. Yeah. So, you know, whereas here when they, when they do like the GAC and, uh, and those kind of things, it's main street, you know, we're, we, we've gotten used to the idea that main street is uh, a place for Christmas to happen year round. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it, but it works. Because there there aren't six different companies competing for that same street to to make it Christmas. For sure. But uh, I think that's a lot of it has to do with that. Uh, Sault Ste. Marie is 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 becoming big as well too, yeah. right? Like that's where Magnetosphere is being done. That's where uh, Tales from the Void yeah. is being done there. So Interesting. yeah, the northern industry part of it is the grant, and part of it I think is the access to uh, locations, accommodations. And, and things like that. I remember when it kind of first started, it was described to me as a bubble, you know, it because it, there, there, there were locations that had never been filmed. So it was kind of, it was ideal for right, that. Right, right. And it was going to grow until it pops and then it's done. But here we are, you know, quite a few years later, we have a studio here in North Bay. We have one opening in calendar, right? Yeah. And it seems to keep growing. Uh, where do you see, do you have any predictions or insights as to what it's going to look I like? I hope it continues to grow. Yeah. Uh, I actually, I'm, I'm very, very nervous. Yeah. Uh, because, 
um, Ryan Reynolds is going to open a studio that's state of the art uh, in uh, Barrie. Oh. So uh, when, you know, Barrie's not that far from North Bay and Barrie's going to have, you know, a sound stage, yeah. a green screen. Like, I mean, I want North Bay to to be the king of the world, but I do know that he's opening that yeah. other studio. And uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but Ryan Reynolds knows a lot of really, really? important people. Well, maybe yeah. I can get in touch with them. Yeah. I'll talk to yeah, him yeah, and exactly, try to convince right? him to right. open one here. Yeah, no, they're, uh, since the minute that he made that announcement, I've been like, wow, they'd like what does North Bay look like in a few years when people are kind of like, well, yeah. we can just go a little bit, you know, we can go north as far as Muskoka, mm -hmm. film, you know, get some footage, and then just drive it on back down to Barry and do cut it all in the there studio and do and it do all the, there, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, do green screen. Who yeah. knows? I, I mean, guess we'll see, but who knows? Yeah. Like you said, maybe that will be overcrowded and then we'll get more people. Yeah, like, I mean, and that's that would be the hope. Yeah. But I mean, you know, like I, it scares me when I look at, uh, you know, like what happens if Ryan Reynolds brings in uh, the volume, Yeah. right? Which is uh, John Favreau's baby, the, uh, the one that allows them to uh, basically the actors exist in a, in a computer graphic environment, mm -hmm. right? What well, happens? That's what's kind of, what happens if they get one of those? Scary too. Uh, obviously, you know, you know yeah. about the strike going on down South, the, the actor and writer yeah, strike. Yeah. I, I heard, this is a rumor, but I'm pretty sure it's true that one of the, the contracts that was offered was like for background actors could sign away their, sign away their, their face scan, like AI face scan. They'd get paid for a day and then right. the studios would have that face to use forever. I don't know how true that is, well, but it's feasible. It makes sense. It's not it's, impossible. I mean, then what you would do is you just uh, um, like mirror those people, right? Yeah, exactly. With different faces and skin them differently. And then the next thing you know, you got yourself a crowd. Okay. There's, there's, I don't know if there's really a time limit, but we'll keep right, it. Yeah, um, hopefully you're going to cut some of it. Holy crap. I wouldn't listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> Long before our film industry took off. Uh, North Bay, as you alluded to, had and still has a thriving theater community. Yeah. How does a relatively small city in northern Ontario get such an immensely talented theater community? Who do we have to thank for the beginnings and the continuation of North Bay Theater? The Gateway Theater Guild has been around for years. Yeah, 75? Six, 75 years. Six that's now, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I got to give props to, uh, I got to give props to Marty first. Uh, give some props to uh, to Rick Blair, who was teaching at Chippewa at the time. Um, also to Bill O'Halloran, who was teaching at West Ferris, I believe. The people that were in challenge went on to theater school. And instead of them settling in Toronto, the Paul Tessiers and Blair Williams of the world and Maureen Cassidy's came back to North Bay to start a theater program. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I definitely have to give a lot of credit to Marty, but I also have to give credit to way, way back to uh, Father Greg Humbert, who was the very, who started Challenge and uh, I'm sorry, the name escapes me. Uh, the it was one of the uh, the nuns. My sister's gonna kill me if she listens to this. She <laughs> we can edit it in. We but can anyway, do voiceover. She, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she, uh, they went down. They saw Godspell. They uh, saw it a number of times. It was the one with uh, Dan Aykroyd and Eugene Gilda Levy. Ratner and Eugene Levy yeah, and the whole yeah. deal, right? And they saw it and they wrote down the script, and then they came <laughs> back to North Bay. And the group challenge back in those days put on that show and they added some letters to the name. So it wasn't, it was uh, Godspell E L L E or something like that. And they, and they did it without the rights, you know, <laughs> and uh, probably couldn't get away with that. No, now. but that story but, yeah. is so important because they were go getters. They found right? a way to do it and they did it. And, uh, and there would not be a challenge if it hadn't been for that. And then there, 
you know, and then without challenge, there wouldn't be an outreach because there wouldn't have been a Marty Southcott who came in to, to direct. And then that Marty Southcott would not have, you know, moved on and done uh, Tauros. And it just keeps going and going and going. And this is my biggest problem as an agent is, is always saying to people, like, I know they're from Northern Ontario. What you don't understand is what they're capable of. Yeah. Because you think... Is there a stigma? Absolutely. Yeah. Ad, I mean, there are people who work in this industry who don't even know that Canada College has an acting for stage and screen program. Yeah. I've had people actually say to me, is there an acting school around here? Is there an acting school around here? Yeah, there's been one here for like <laughs> 25 years, but yeah, you're yeah, there's an acting school around here. So it's it's crazy to me, right? But if but if those are people in Northern Ontario who don't know that, then why would a casting director from Toronto have any clue yeah. that Northern Ontario has something to offer? Why would they know that Sudbury has an acting studio? They wouldn't. And and that probably also contributed to that again that film and TV boom when people started casting Northern and they said oh wow these they can act they can yeah they were like oh, wow, these these guys have training <laughs> so so the issue is the attitude is still that you have to go down to Toronto to do all these things but people are starting to wake up to the idea it's like no well we'll probably wrap it up uh, any final qu- comments you'd like to to spread out into the world uh, any other yeah, well, I mean, I guess one of the things I would like to say is that, uh, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to come on. But if I were going to um, sell the agency, what I would say is if people do, uh, particularly people of uh, diverse background, uh, ethnicity, um, uh, gender, whatever, uh, want to get a hold of me because they are actors, uh, that'd be great. Because uh, I certainly would love to represent a better example of of what, you know, North Bay is becoming yeah. as opposed to it just being simply... And just uh, of the general population the too, The general right? population, like, yeah, but particularly that's... North Bay is not what it was when I was growing up. But on film, we can't tell that. Yeah. I want to be able to make Northern Ontario films also show... The diversity that of is Northern present yeah. here in North Bay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. There you go. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on. Yeah. Well, thank Appreciate you for your time. Thank you for having me. Cool. Okay. I will. Uh, we'll. We'll cut it there. <laughs> okay.